Is it possible that you're the single most politically incorrect person in your entire discipline? In <laughs> you got to be well, at least top five. There are few people louder than I am. You know, I, I mean, I have papers critiquing microaggressions, critiquing implicit bias, arguing that the evidence, mostly not mine, shows that uh, the 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 beliefs that most people, at least as assessed in the research, the beliefs that people hold about groups often thought of as stereotypes are reasonably accurate. My guess is that a lot of like the people on the left that would that would be in favor of that uh, kind of thing, they might not view themselves as being authoritarian because I think they, they view themselves inherently as being the defenders of the defenseless. Right. And so for them, like if for them to engage that kind of thing, like to them, it's kind of like we are fighting back against the bully. Everything we do is self-defense, even if it's preemptive self-defense, it's still self-defense. In this video, I'm speaking with Dr. Lee Jessam, an award-winning, extensively published social psychologist, distinguished professor of psychology, and former department chair at Rutgers University. While Lee is on the political left himself, he has been one of few voices within academic social psychology, one of the most left-skewed disciplines in all of academia, to publicly oppose the corrupting influence of this ideological imbalance on research and education in the field. Lee is a founding member of several organizations, most notably Heterodox Academy, dedicated to promoting open inquiry, viewpoint diversity, constructive disagreement, and a movement away from ideologically skewed education and research. In this video, Lee gives us an insider's view into the highly politicized nature of academic social psychology and how this skewing affects scholars within the field and thus the quality of the research produced. We discuss the famous replication crisis and how it appears that ideological bias was a contributing factor in generating unreliable psychological research. We discuss stereotype threat, stereotype accuracy, the implicit association test, and the Stanford Prison Experiment. And of course, we discuss how these same ideological issues that started largely in the academic community have bled into and are having major effects on American culture and politics. Lee Jessam, thank you so much for joining me. This is going to be fun, I think. I think uh, I wouldn't be surprised if you were one of... Is, is it possible that you're the single most politically incorrect person in your entire discipline? In <laughs> you got to be well, at least so, up high. So, first of all, I don't think that's actually true. Okay. But, but I also say what I think. And I that combination of being willing to say what I think evidence shows, yeah. even when it is largely inconsistent with phenomena or even values held sacred in academia, um, there are few people louder than I am. You know, I, I mean, I have papers critiquing microaggressions, critiquing implicit bias, arguing that the evidence, mostly not mine, shows that uh, the, the, the beliefs that most people, at, at least as assessed in the research, the beliefs that people hold about groups often thought of as stereotypes are reasonably accurate and right. much more accurate than most social psychological hypotheses, actually. It's like just the here. data. So an yeah. example that might be the stereotype that men are stronger than women. It's not always true, but it's true right. often than not. Like that kind of thing. Would that be an example of that? Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, I mean, it's just, you know, stereotypes is our loaded word. People, you know, often define them mm -hmm. as having all these pejorative characteristics mm -hmm. um, um, and they'll define them as sort of irrational and accurate. And, it, you know, that's fine. That's why I sort of hesitated a little bit on how to talk about beliefs about groups because if you define stereotypes as inaccurate and sort of steeped in prejudice well then an accurate belief isn't a stereotype like right. it's some other thing if you define stereotypes in, as, as this really kind of you know sinister sort of way which is justifiable or can be justifiable that's fine but then you have to talk about people's beliefs then but then you can't you, know, you can't assume that people's beliefs are inaccurate just because you label them a stereotype then you actually need evidence yep. that the belief is pejorative and untrue 
Uh, mm -hmm. So I'm fine if you want to call beliefs about groups something other than a stereotype. That that's fine. Um, uh, you know, we could call it beliefs about groups or something like that. Um, but when you ask people about their beliefs and then compare them to really pretty solid standards like census data or meta-analysis on group differences, usually, not always, there are some exceptions, some pretty systematic exceptions, um, people are pretty good. Like, you know, again, there's no evidence that people are perfect and no person should arrogantly and presumptuously assume that every belief they hold about a group is right just because, you know, the weight of the evidence is that in general, people's beliefs about groups, that is, you know, people's beliefs about groups might be generally right. That doesn't mean your belief is right. I, I, you know, so you can't assume any of that. But, you know, again, to the extent that there, the, the criteria is evidence, the evidence is pretty good. But it's not just, you know, it's just across the board. But yeah, so as people can tell, I think it's this um, conversation is going to have a lot of relevance to academic psychology and the academic <laughs> academia. But just you know, stereotypes. This is this is one of those things where the, what happens in academia bleeds out to the whole culture. So like most of the things we are going to be talking about are not just relevant to the universities. It's 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 like it's in our politics. It's in our culture at large. A lot of it's going to yeah. be. You have a great voice. You got a little echo in there that is very, you know, you, ha, have you ever done like voiceover or commercials or something? You have a great voice. Oh, oh thank you. I appreciate, no, no, no. I've, I've actually been told that, not about commercials, but I've been told about the voice before. So thank you. Um, yeah, I've, I've also been told I have a great face for podcasting. <laughs> oh, okay, so first off, what is going on in academic psychology in general and social psychology in particular? Well, what do you mean? What is going on? What do you well interpret that however you want? You you've been kind of on a bit of a mission the last bunch of years. <laughs> um, so obviously, I'm not talking. I'm not asking you about the finer points of vision science. Uh, <laughs> 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 yeah. Well, so you you kind of have cross cutting things or two things that I see as as in conflict with each other. So one reaction, one response to the replication crisis. So I don't know how much your listeners will know about this, about 10 years yeah, or so ago. Just to lay it out, just, you know, assume. Yeah, that. yeah. Yeah, there were, there were a slew of revelations of everything from fraud to unreplicable famous studies to researchers using really lie to the point of sinister tactics to get stuff published. Science is a liar sometimes. I mean, we're all, it's publish or perish. All sorts of things, good things come for publishing for academics, promotions and raises and, uh, you know, a platform for a book, you know, ideally a best-selling book, grants and awards, it all stems from this. And so there's for heavy incentives. Your dreams fall apart because you didn't get tenure and had to leave academia. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's all, you know, so there's all sorts of pressures on that. And, and it was normative in the field, I think, till about 10 years ago, um, for people to cut and slice their research production findings, their studies, uh, you know, both, um, to, to, let's put it differently, to selectively report their studies um, in ways that allowed them to craft, you know, compelling narratives. So let's say I run four studies and two show something in one direction, one has a null result, and one shows the thing in the opposite direction. Well, no journal is going to publish that because the results are all, are, are all over the place. And they'll say, well, you know, uh, you really need to nail this phenomena down before you know that, that, that. That's really, that's still probably pretty common. But so what that incentivized people to do was just like not report the, the study pr uh, providing the opposite result or the null result. Now you have two beautiful studies all saying the same thing. And wow, you're amazing. Look what you just discovered. The journals were filled with stuff like that. Yeah, it's almost and like so, the old tax industry stuff where they would only publish the studies that didn't show lung cancer. Smoke. Uh, yeah, yeah, yes, right. It is kind of like that. It is kind of like that. That's right. So there were all these revelations around 10 years ago about this and about how bad psych did, was going wrong and did go wrong because of this, especially my discipline of social psychology. So not everyone, but a, a lot of people took this as inspiration to figure out 
what the field needed to do to improve its methods and, and practices and statistics and theories and really everything in order to produce a more robust science. And so, for example, there have been a whole slew of things, but one that's really taken off and that is now common is pre-registration. So in a pre-registration, which no one did this before, or almost no one did this before 10 years ago, you create a permanent public document that describes what studies you plan to conduct, your methods, how you plan to conduct them, your hypotheses, and your the analyses you plan to conduct to test those hypotheses, and what you would take as evidence that supports or disconfirms your hypothesis. Now, the value of that is it makes it much harder to cherry pick and to engage in selective reporting. Right. Um, so, and, and so that has helped. I mean, again, there's no silver bullets, but, but uh, there's pretty good evidence that things have gotten better in part because of that. Uh, you know, another, another common thing, again, until about 10 years ago, where, where people would run, you know, uh, these, these, these problems are all connected. A common problem was people would run these very small experiments with, you know, eight or 10 or 12 people in an experimental condition. And so they would run 5, 10, 15, 20 of these studies because it was really easy to run studies with eight or 10 people in an experiment. You know, you, you, the whole experiment would have 25 or 35 or 40 people in it. And it was incredible. And so you could run zillions of those, mm. right? And so then what, what got, got published was, well, you know, if 16 out of 20 didn't work, didn't matter. You just reported the four that worked. Smoke. And on top of that, these are all tiny studies. And small N studies have produced highly uncertain results. Like no matter what they produce, no one should give them much credibility because they're yeah. based on such small sample sizes. It's kind of like, a, this is, yeah, I'm a big baseball fan. And like one of the yes. big is small samples, like just because a hitter is hitting 400 over 20 at bats or hitting, right. 20, don't take it too seriously. Right. You had a bad week or a great week, whatever. Uh, right. I, I mean, Willie Mays, I, you know, I think went something like 0 for 25 when he first came into the majors. Yeah. This, is, this is Willie Mays is one of the greatest yeah. players who ever played. So so, okay, great. Yeah. So you're you're a baseball guy too. That's gonna help. <laughs> um, so here's the thing. Okay, so with the replication crisis, when I first heard about that, I wasn't even one percent surprised because, like, part of the reason why I left graduate school at Rutgers was I realized that the odds were staggeringly low to get a professorship, and I was studying how kids learn their first language, and so it's like what am I going to offer to the open market by saying I've spent the last seven or eight years studying how kids generalize their earliest verbs? It's, it's very low utility. And so it wasn't surprising at all for me to see, you know, like that kind of thing. And at first, my interpretation was publish or perish. And relatedly to baseball, I remember reading years ago that contrary to what a lot of people think, the players that are most likely to use performance enhancing drugs are not the top players like Sammy Sosa and Barry Bonds and Mark McGuire. They're the players that like are barely in or barely out. And it makes sense because let's say that you're comfortably in the league, you're an everyday regular and you can increase your performance right. to 10%. Okay. Instead of making 8 million a year, you're making 17. Great. It's better. But like, in the other at the bottom end it's like we're talking about making one million a year or having to go be a plumber right so it's more and it, it's kind of like that and I, I felt like in academia yeah. like it's completely predictable so i just like i'm like oh yeah replication christ P people are fudging their numbers to save their careers but now i'm wondering do you think that i i figure you probably think that probably is the biggest factor but would you also say a minority contributing factor that is non-trivial is political bias well so I don't think political bias or ideological bias, however you want to think about that, mostly manifests as unreplicable studies. And one reason I don't think it mostly manifests that way is because the biases are often built into the studies. Oh, so it's, and it's, not, it's like the selection of what we study as opposed what to what we study and yeah. how we study it and how we interpret the findings of those studies. Right. So I'll give you one example, but I have millions. For decades, the lore within, across the social sciences was that there was no such thing 
as left-wing authoritarianism in the democratic uh, west yeah right now now there was a lot of research on right-wing authoritarianism yeah. that came out of world war ii in an effort to understand the nazis and how that could happen and stuff mm -hmm. and that did two things one researchers follow others leads all the time so by setting the course on fine studying right-wing authoritarianism there's like thousands of studies on right-wing authoritarianism now. So if you just looked at the literature until a couple of years ago, you would see all this stuff on right-wing authoritarian, uh, right authoritarianism and almost nothing or nothing on left-wing authoritarianism. And you would conclude that authoritarianism on the left, there's no evidence for this. There's like no evidence that this is a problem, whereas there's lots of evidence that right-wing authoritarianism is a problem. Now, the work wasn't not replicable. You know, I mean, if you, if you ask questions a certain way, you will consistently get a certain number of people answering them. So one of the kinds of quite classic right-wing authoritarianism questions is we need a strong leader. This is a kind of question, and I'm paraphrasing. I'm sure I don't have it exactly right. We need strong leaders to stamp out the corruption that is ruining our society. Right. Well, <laughs> you know, that is a sort of right wing, a far right way of thinking about the world. Okay, so, so you're going to consistently get people on the far right saying, yeah, that's exactly what we need. It's not like there's a replication problem there. That, that's clearly replicable. The I could problem see left saying the same thing though too. Like it, like you know, with political, with economic inequality growing, eventually some of them are going to be like, we need a strong progressive. Who's well, not gonna... that's right. Yes. Yeah. So, so, so that trend, you turn out to be absolutely right about that. For 50 years, no one thought to frame the question as we need a strong progressive leader to wipe out the fascists. <laughs> <laughs> like, this has never occurred to anybody to ask it that way. And then a team about five years ago came along and all they did was they flipped the direction of lots of the questions. Okay. So, and once you flip the direction, you say what well, we need are strong progressive leaders. What well, our country really needs is a strong determined leader who will crush the evil of pushy Christian religious people and take us forward to our true path. Okay. Right? So, so when you ask the question like that, you know, you, you get tons of people saying, tons of people on the left, saying, yeah, that's exactly what we need. So it was really not very hard to discover substantial numbers of, of left-wing authoritarians, but it just never occurred to anybody acro across the disciplines to flip the targets of the, on the questionnaire. So it's not a replication issue. You know, it is a political bias issue, but it's not a replication issue. My guess is that a lot of like the people on the left that would that would be in favor of that uh, kind of thing, they might not view themselves as being authoritarian because I think they, they view themselves inherently as being the defenders of the defenseless. Right. And so for them, like if for them to engage that kind of thing, like to them, it's kind of like we are fighting back against the bully. Everything we do is self-defense, even if it's preemptive self-defense, it's still self-defense. Oh, yeah. listen. I mean, you're, one, you're absolutely right about that. People don't want to think of themselves in pejorative terms. So people don't want to think of themselves as authoritarians. And I think that's probably true for most of the people on the far right also. Um, in fact, I think a lot of the, you know, uh, I mean, if you think about the January 6th yeah. rioters, right? They thought what they were doing was defending America uh, and defending democracy uh, against, you know, attempts to, you know, destroy the democracy by stealing an election. That's what they, that's what they, I, right. I think most of them, there may be some exceptions, but I think most of them believe that's what they were doing. That doesn't, that, you know, that doesn't vindicate what they did at all. It was, you know, right. It was a still, yeah. still a violent yeah. attempt to overthrow the election, which is, you know, this is what authoritarians do. They engage in, right, in aggression against their yeah. opponents in violence. They engage in sense attempts to censor and, sh and punish their opponents and it doesn't matter if they you know talk about yeah uh, there's, so, a, there's a greater like one of the things i do on this channel is like because like, like, one of the reasons i started it was because i was so sick and tired of seeing just non-stop um slant 
Like I go to a right wing source and they, and the lefties are all stupid and evil. And then I go to a left wing source and the right wing, the right wing are all stupid and evil. And so I just want to say like, we're talking about the extreme here. There are so many people on the left that are perfectly good people. And there are absolute, like maybe what we should be, it's, it's a, it, left and right is part of this, but an even bigger part of this is authoritarian versus like libertarian. And there are, yeah. there are like lefty libertarian types, like cultural libertarian types and righty cultural libertarian types. And, You'll have free speech advocates on the left, like Kyle Kalinske, and then you'll have strategically free speech people on the right, like someone like a Ron DeSantis, who will who will talk about the importance of free speech when it's his ideas or the ideas of people he likes being suppressed. But then it's like I, I saw in your GB News appearance, you talked about the Stop Woke Act and how it was almost curbing or getting rid of tenure, academic tenure, which is a, the fundamental purpose of that is protecting freedom of thought and speech. So that's that's absolutely true, but it's actually even worse than that because DeSantis' Stop Woke Act included banning from higher education. Now, you know, you've got to be careful here because the states have every right to set the curriculum for K-12. to Like, that's their job. Mm -hmm. And if you set the curriculum, by definition, you're including some things and you're excluding other things. That is completely legitimate. But academic freedom protects uh, universities and actually so at state universities, which is the only thing that governors such as DeSantis have any authority over, are not only protected by general principles of academic freedom, they are protected by the First Amendment. Because the state, that is governors such as DeSantis, cannot be telling people what they can and cannot say. So when they try to ban divisive concepts or critical race theory or whatever, you know, whatever the miscellaneous things were in that bill, which included those top, they, they were, it, it, this is absolutely unconstitutional. It was completely illegitimate. And, and DeSantis kind of, in my view, the Stop Woke Act and DeSantis's efforts are, in my opinion, a mixed bag. There are some things that are reasonable, but the attempt to ban ideas, even ideas that I find revolting, you cannot, the state cannot be in the business of, of banning ideas or discussion. So one question I'd have is, so there's free speech on the other hand, and then there is the government uh, and the schools endorsing particular views. So for example, like, I don't think you'd have, do you have a problem with schools banning the teaching of creationism? I don't, because that's not science. We can maybe well, teach about it, as it is, but let's not act like it's on par with evolution. Right. So. There's, there's different issues there. And the, the creationism actually has been resolved by the courts, right? Because uh, creationism, the courts have ruled and correctly, in my opinion, is not a, a legitimate form of, of biological science mm. or, or of any science. Mm. So it just doesn't deserve to be treated as, you could teach about creationism. I mean, I actually teach about creationism when I do classes on research methodology, actually, right. Right. because it's a great example of something that, you know, sometimes can appear to have the trappings of science, but it's completely illegitimate as science. Then it's, and I can unpack that. But that, you know, so, so there, I, I have a paper from a couple of years ago. The, the core idea is, was a sort of expose of attempts to suppress ideas in academia, both formally and informally. So not so much from the state, but by other academics. So there's been this rise in the last 10 years or so of, um, of duly published papers. So paper is submitted to a journal, it undergoes peer review, it passes peer review, and the paper's published. Mm. The paper then pisses you know, off a whole bunch of academics. So there have been a whole slew of papers like this. There was, um, uh, there was Rebecca Tuvel, she's a philosopher, um, published a paper on transracialism. So this was in response to, the, there was some, Rachel Dolezal, I think, there was yeah, some woman yeah. who was, right, who was, who was Jewish, I think, and I claimed that she was black. Yeah. Um, and there was, she had no black ancestry. Um, this eventually was exposed and she was kind of publicly humiliated and had to step down. Okay, so, so Rebecca Tuvel, who is a philosopher, writes this article, Basically, and I'm oversimplifying a little, but not a whole lot, saying that, well, if you can be transgender, yeah, why yeah. can't you be transracial? Like, right. you know, if it's all entirely constructive and it's all a matter of, of how you identify, why right. can't you have transracialism? 
Okay, yeah. so this completely freaked out academia. There were thousands and thousands of people calling for the paper to be retracted. Like half of the editorial, I'm inventing the numbers, but something like some large proportion of the editorial board resigned, uh, but they did not actually retract that paper. But the more interesting thing to me was the academics calling it for it to be retracted. That's what shows the censoriousness of academia. Okay, so there have been a slew of things like this. There's um, Bruce Gilley, who I used to professor of political science or political history has a paper titled the case for colonialism look how awkward it is in here right now and the idea was that you know colonialism may have been very bad in some places but in some places it actually made things better and and for and one of the pieces of evidence he uses is that under uh, uh, cl under in certain places under colonial rule you had people migrating to the places under colonial rule because kind of life was better there. Uh, you were less likely to be attacked and, and to be uh, sort of captured and turned into us and being enslaved. And, uh, you know, sort of there was greater economic e economic activity and, 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 and production and all that. And it was just like life was better. So, you know, but to defend colonialism, you know, in the, in the 21st century is taboo. I mean, it's just completely taboo. And again, there were thousands of people calling for the uh, academics calling for the paper to be retracted. He eventually was subject to death threats. Good God. Like, like, like I, I get the opposition to that because like, even if there were good effects, like in a way you can look at that as like, if we can kill one man and cure cancer, it's almost like that. It's like, it doesn't make the killing the one person right. But like, so I get people being a, like stridently opposed to it, but how about this reply, respond? I know, right. I know, right. Exactly. Exactly. That's exactly right. So, so anyway, yeah. in this, in our paper that was on these kinds of incidents, actually the lead author is Sean Stevens. He is the head researcher at FIRE, the Foundation for Individual yeah. Rights in, in Expression and Expression. And he is very good. He's like one of the most knowledgeable people I know on these topics. Mm. Um, and he points out, this is your sort of like your creation science example. Let's say you have a professor who believes in flat earth mm -hmm. can the person be fired it Based. depends it depends let's say the person and the example that sean kind of you know sean wrote this section that he walks through let's say this is a french a professor of french teaches you know french literature french history the french language never brings it up in class but he goes he has a twitter account social media account and he's like encouraging people to join the flat earth society he cannot be fired for that Good. because it has nothing to do with his work, yep. right? Okay. Now, let's say he's teaching his French literature class and he starts pontificating about how the flatness of the earth and he's like requiring it on his tests. Well, that's completely incompetent. It has no place <laughs> in a class on French literature of the French language of French history. So he could absolutely be, be fired for that. And so to bring it back that, to critical race theory in the class, I guess here the distinction is is the teacher teaching it in an endorsing fashion or are they right. teaching just about it and and right. is it relevant to the course material so like if it's a, so, a right. social studies class and they're teaching you just simply some people think this here's what they think that's right for and against completely legit legit and intellectually appropriate like i would yeah. support that yeah, yeah, absolutely. Like, like I used to be a part of like atheist activist organizations and even the head of our organization who I interviewed on this channel a few months ago, Justin Trottier, he and I would have been totally fine teaching comparative religion in class because it is useful to know. Just don't absolutely one of them and we're good. Right. Exactly. Uh, that's it for episode one. In the coming episodes, Lee and I will be covering a broad range of topics, including but not limited to Lee's personal politics, BLM, how ideological bias skews social psychology, which in turn misdirects society at large. We will talk about what may be the single biggest fraud in academic psychology history, the Stanford prison experiment, and we will talk about whether or not it's a good idea to pursue a PhD in academic psychology. Subscribe so that you don't miss any of it.